Few people traveling on Hungary Road seem to take time to appreciate that they're driving through one of the county's two historic districts. Unless, that is, a train has other plans for them. A quick look around while waiting at the crossing will reveal that this is no ordinary Henrico neighborhood. The area has been known as Hungary, Hungary Station, Jenningsville, School, and finally Laurel. The centerpiece of the district is a striking brick landmark once known as the Robert Stiles Building. It was named for a major of artillery in the Army of Northern Virginia who turned his attention to prison reform after the war and was at the center of a sprawling complex that formed the state's first reformatory or industrial school. Laurel is listed as a National Historic District. The National Register was established in 1966 to identify areas that are significant to state, local, and national history. And Laurel is important to all of those things. On a state level, it was a reformatory established for young boys who were headed down the wrong path. And so the idea was to um, guide these young men, nurture them along so that they could become productive members of society. And it was an idea that had gone all the way back to Governor Fitzhugh Lee, who believed that this was a necessary thing to do for young people. I'm sorry to have to do this, but you'll spend the next three years at the State Industrial School for Boys. The progressive movement, which had spawned reformatories in the northern states in the 1840s and 50s, was slow to take hold in Virginia. When the state legislature failed to act on Governor Lee's recommendation to separate juvenile and adult offenders, a group of prominent citizens, men who had made their name in the Confederate Army, in business, and in politics, stepped forward to take action. In March 1890, they formed the Prison Association of Virginia, which had altruistic, but not necessarily realistic, ambitions. Adolescence as a concept really doesn't get much traction in America until almost 1900. But they are beginning to understand that there is a troublesome time in both boys' and girls' lives. And that's a relatively modern concept. So it became incumbent upon those who were worried about juveniles and worried about juvenile crime to take the step provide the money, in many cases, for institutions like this. Uh, it is an altruistic motive that is at work. I think Laurel is interesting because so much of it is still standing. Laurel was established as a historic district because there are five contributing buildings to the Laurel Industrial School that are still standing. The contributing buildings are the dormitory, the administrative office, housing for some of the teachers. So it's really remarkable that you can drive into this community and the story is right there, all to be told. So it's very transporting. It becomes this community out of time. In November 1890, the Prison Association of Virginia received their first boy from the Corporation Court in Lynchburg. At that point, the reformatory was operating in Eastern Henrico in a donated house. When 12 more boys were committed in the six months that followed, plans were made for better accommodations, which included the purchase of 90 acres at Laurel Station. From there, the facility grew in response to demand. Word of Laurel spread quickly throughout Virginia's halls of justice, and by January 1896, the population had grown to an overwhelming 132 boys. Addressing the General Assembly on behalf of the association, James Caskey admitted the shortcomings of the organization. He said, The labor of establishing and conducting our reformatory in which only white boys are received has been so onerous and incessant that we have been able to do but little in furtherance of the other objects of the association, which are the improvement of the prisons and jails of the state, the aid of discharged convicts, etc. The rapid increase in numbers prompted the legislature that year to fund, almost in its entirety, a new building, which would house a kitchen, washroom, dining hall, schoolroom, and dormitory. Well, I think what really strikes you first is the large brick dormitory building. And then across the street from that are these really nice, 
Victorian style buildings that seemingly are a mismatch to what you're looking at, which is a very institutional style building. But that's what intrigues you, and that's why it's nice to have the stake marker, which explains that this is what you're looking at. The building, well, the large building here, which remains, was a dormitory that uh, in the days of the incarceration had 111 beds in it for children of various ages, some as young as six and seven years old. Uh, it's hard to believe that a child would be sent to virtually a prison, but it was the alternative to going to an adult prison. Boys were sent to Laurel from every corner of the Commonwealth for a wide variety of offenses. They ranged from mere vagrancy to horrific crimes. And in the early years of the institution, boys were handed indeterminate sentences, meaning they were held until they were reformed, however long that took. Of the first 228 boys to be discharged, the average detention was one year, nine months, and 12 days, according to an annual report. Part of the process of reformation at an industrial school was work, as the name implies. The basis for reform school, hardcore reform school, especially in the South, was labor. They want them to be productive. They want them to be seen as productive members of society. Boys, you are here to be made into good citizens. I trust that you'll take advantage of this opportunity. You'll be taught a trade at which you can earn an honest living when you are released. Obey the rules, and you can profit by this experience. Disobey them, and you will be punished. In other words, you will get out of this institution exactly what you put into it. What they wanted was a laborer who had a bit of an education and clean morals. That's the ultimate goal of a place like Laurel is to be morally fit to enter society and to stay in society. If you had an education to boot, great. Uh, it gave you other opportunities in society. On weekdays, reform meant eight hours labor, two hours and 45 minutes in school, one hour of play, and one visiting hour. Mealtimes were silent. Conversation was banned. The boys worked five hours on Saturdays. The rest was holiday, with two hours, 35 minutes for family and friends to visit. There were no visiting hours on Sundays. The boys, as many as 325 of them by 1910, were organized into families of 30 to 50 boys to one keeper, who minded them round the clock. While some boys were hired out to local residents, others worked at a succession of different enterprises on the grounds at Laurel. They began with the manufacture of horse collars, then shirts. Those who didn't work in the factory worked on the farm, in the kitchen, shoe shop, greenhouse, or did laundry. Boys were kept busy making repairs and chopping wood or making bricks, some of which can still be seen at the former superintendent's residence and administration building, which they also helped build. In 1903, Laurel introduced Sloyd, a method of manual training that originated in Sweden. It taught the boys the craft of woodworking to, in the words of then Prison Association President Charles Hutzler, prevent idleness, develop the energies of the boys, employ their hands, and engage their thoughts. Children were allowed to sell their creations and the proceeds were paid out upon release. The other tenuous experiments in manufacturing were intended to offset the cost of running the institution, but never met their goals. They were meant to be contained little communities that were self-sufficient and thus wouldn't put too much of a burden on the state's taxpayers. And in that regard, they also hoped to recoup some of their investment by having either the boys or people who were hired supply the food for it. And the boys at Laurel Industrial School are not dining on steak and potatoes. They are living on a bare minimum because that's what's there. That's what uh, the funding is there for. And Hustler is going to the General Assembly not on a daily basis, of course, but he's there every year 
trying to bang some sense into the folks at the General Assembly, look, we need this if we are going to run a proper institution that will rehabilitate these children. One such appeal in 1902 went as follows. Our sanitary arrangements are of the most primitive character and not at all in keeping with modern requirements. Our water supply is sadly deficient and is coming to be a source of great anxiety to the officers. Our dormitories are taxed to their utmost capacity and afford no accommodations for our rapidly increasing numbers. The Laurel experience wasn't all deprivation and hard labor, though. The boys had occasions to look forward to, like the state fair. Holidays were celebrated. They went to baseball games, sang, played music. They even had their own theatrical troupe. Great pains were taken to make the institution feel less like prison, despite the threats of solitary confinement and the whip. What Laurel was trying to do is to recreate life on the outside, as it were. They want the children to have the experiences that children have in normal life. They want a theatrical troupe. They want a band. They want these children, and they are children, to experience what a middle-class child in the public school system might have in order to uplift them, to make them understand there is something besides the life that you were headed to. There is music. There is theater. If you're good at this, conceivably, you can make a living at it. You do not have to be a low life for all of your life. There are other things out there. We want to introduce you to them. Laurel is in the business of uplift. To encourage respect for the institution, the boys were given a wide latitude of freedom. That freedom came at a cost when some took advantage of it. Windows were broken. Boys escaped. A guard was murdered. A boy was shot. The severity of discipline, or lack thereof, at Laurel was always a contentious issue, and charges of inhumane treatment sparked an 1898 investigation by the House Committee on Prisons and Asylums. The idea has always been with almshouses, poorhouses, when the penitentiary was first created, that society is doing these people a favor. Those receiving the favor were never quite as grateful as most folks thought they should be. The belief at the time was, yes, this is altruistic, but the overall belief in how one treated children had not really changed since time immemorial, and that is uh, spare the rod, spoil the child. So corporal punishment is a part of all educational experiences, not just the Laurel Industrial School. The boys who went to Laurel probably did not expect uh, a vacation, but they certainly didn't expect the discipline they got uh, and the viciousness of it. It's not an institution you wanted to spend a whole lot of time in. Even though it's being presented to you as your chance to make good, the penitentiary was seen as your chance to make good. The boys are different because they are boys. There is some way that we can rehabilitate these people, we believe. And if that rehabilitation involved what was normal punishment elsewhere, so be it. It was just considerably more brutal. And boys often rebelled. If you were beaten enough, the urge to escape was inescapable. Escapes were common. They, like the crimes that had landed the boys at Laurel in the first place, were regular fodder for the state's newspapers. In the second half of 1910 alone, 31 boys fled. Reclaimed escapees had chains attached to their ankles so their movements could be heard. Prison Association President Charles Hutzler, on a 1911 visit to Laurel, found inmate Lorenzo Lockie shackled with two chains and two iron balls. The boy begged to have them removed. They believed in their heart of hearts that chains were proper. They were certainly proper in the poorhouse. They were certainly proper at the penitentiary. If you were recalcitrant enough to require chaining, they would chain you. Uh, if you were recalcitrant enough to be flogged, they would flog you. When reported lashes reached as high as 300 in a single month, Charles Hutzler concluded that the valuable trait of sympathy 
had not been cultivated by Laurel Superintendent George B. Davis. Still, Hutzler stood resolute when he faced the General Assembly in 1902. We do not claim to be able to redeem every boy that we receive, but the large majority of those who come within our influence are certainly elevated into a moral plane above that which they previously occupied and eagerly look forward to the time of their release when they may be permitted to resume their places in the ranks of the state's toilers. Are they going to come out and be productive members of society? Not necessarily. And certainly by 1911, uh, when Davis and Hunsler and everybody are fighting over what this institution will be, they realize recidivism is high. Uh, the chances to uplift these children and create something that the public will be satisfied with aren't that great, but they keep trying. They do keep trying. When a disagreement over the quality of food for the boys erupted between the superintendent and President Hutzler, it spilled onto the pages of the Richmond Evening Journal with Davis, who had resigned his post, criticizing the institution from top to bottom, calling it a nursery of vice and crime. This brought about a second investigation into the reformatory, this time by the State Board of Charities and Corrections. Although the Prison Association of Virginia was absolved of any mismanagement, it was recommended to then Governor Mann that the state take control of Laurel as soon as possible. Starting in the 19-teens, the 1920s, efficiency is the call. We have got to be more efficient. You see it in industry, uh, you see it in business. Uh, the world is speeding up and people were able to come to the state legislature finally and tell them, look, if you want to cut down on expenses, if you want to have something that seems to work, we've got to do it like those folks up north do it. We've got to consolidate and we've got to start accepting ideas that have been in vogue for years uh, in the states above us and start adapting them uh, to the 20th century in Virginia. And that's how places like Laurel actually begin to be uh, funded at the state level and of course when you start funding them at the state level then you want control. Virginia's just trying to move into the 20th century in that regard and it is taken out of the hands of so-called amateurs, uh, amateurs with good hearts, make no mistake about that, amateurs with good hearts but they're amateurs and we need to more professionalize every part of the state government that we can. So you start to see the state taking over responsibilities that have been those uh, left to counties or to individuals in the South since time immemorial. On February 21, 1920, the state's reform schools were ordered to transfer all property and control to the Commonwealth. The Laurel operation was gradually relocated to Beaumont in Powhatan County, where badly needed additional farmland was purchased. The original campus at Laurel was repurposed for other private and public functions. The Adeline Russell Building was revived as the Laurel Elementary School, but was eventually demolished. Other support buildings became residences, and a golf course was even carved out of the farmland. The old tailor shop becoming its clubhouse. The Robert Stiles Building was used as a grocery store and apartments, but by the 1980s was vacant and tattered. When plans to refurbish the building and convert it into apartments were scrapped, the building went up for auction. As fate would have it, only one man showed up at the sale out of curiosity. It was the Reverend Dr. Robert Bluford, Jr., who happened to have a keen interest in historic preservation. My father purchased the building, uh, I think, in 1983, and he had been involved in saving the Laurel Presbyterian Church, uh, which was up on Old Staples Mill Road, a couple hundred yards from this building, and uh, had moved it across the golf course to its present location off Staples Mill Road. And he got interested in saving this building. It uh, had been in dis terrible disrepair. All the windows were pretty much knocked out, and it had been vacant for about nine years uh, prior to 83. Uh, when the store closed down. So I got it really in order to keep it from just simply falling into the, on the ground. There was, uh, 
And so there's a lot of history surrounding it. It was a shame just to see it disappear. And I moved my medical supply business into that building in 1985, so that's how I actually came to the building. I, I watched my father labor over trying to save and, and restore the second floor, which was where we moved into for two years. He would come out here every day and, and uh, work and help clean the building out, which was part of the biggest project, was cleaning all the junk out of the building. It had been totally occupied by I can't imagine how many hundreds of pigeons, so needless to say, that was a heck of a cleanup job. I mean, one of the most interesting things I found, uh, the third floor remained vacant for a number of years, but up on the third floor were, were these heart pine beams, exposed beams in a, in a very intricate uh, truss system, which I later found out was a, a bridge truss system. And there doesn't appear to be another roof truss system like that exposed in the entire state. It had been recommended to me because we were going to rent it out as office space uh, to put a drop ceiling in there. Everybody wanted to hide that beautiful ceiling and it was just too pretty to cover up. So I, I, just, I immediately fell in love with it and I spent about a year uh, at nights and on the weekends with a palm sander actually hand sanding those beams and, and uh, putting some stain and varnish on them to preserve them. So that's probably the most interesting piece of the structure historically. So I'm glad I did it. I can't tell you I enjoyed the entire time up on the scaffolding, but it was worth it. I think it's remarkable that we have people who are willing to step forward and say, look, this can be rehabbed, this can be used, and we can still enjoy the aesthetic of it. I mean, architecture at that time was, was very fascinating, and I think that it teaches us a lot about not only who we are, but what was important to us back then. And, and I think that when you have individuals and organizations that care about maintaining that, that it goes a long way to really making us proud of who we are and where we come from. Well, I'm gonna steal a phrase from my father, which is probably what inspired me to continue the renovation of the building uh, the way that I have done it to try to get it back like it was originally, and that's that, uh, you know, history needs to be touched and felt and, and not just seen in pictures. And, and I mean, I think too many of our, our, our cherished historic buildings have been torn down, and this is a piece of history that's been preserved that somebody can come and actually put their eyes on, see it, see how it used to look. I think it's a way of honoring the past without being a slave to the past. We're living in a whole different world uh, in that time from what went on here 100 years ago. And it's good to, to look back and not try to reconstruct the past into the present, but to remember that there was something going on before we ever showed up. Today, we expect juvenile and adult courts to be separate. We take for granted that minors are no longer sent to adult penitentiaries and that the quality of children's care will not be predicated upon the success or failure of business ventures that utilize their labor. But while reformatories like Laurel faded into history, some of the established norms of its day stubbornly persisted late into the 20th century. Well, Johnny, you're in a pretty serious situation. This isn't the first time you've stolen things. I can send you to the industrial school till you're 21. You know that, don't you? I think our idea of children and their ability to understand their actions and their level of culpability has evolved over time. And there was certainly a time when people just thought that if you commit a crime, you've committed a crime and there's no, there's no difference really between adults and children in terms of that and that you need to be punished severely. You three boys are yourselves responsible for your acts. Obviously our thinking has evolved, thankfully. And we created juvenile courts as a way to uh, treat children differently. And in the beginning, juvenile court was basically an equity court. And the idea was to do whatever the court needed to do to intervene and help that child go on a straighter path. Though separate courts began springing up around the nation beginning in 1899, the proceedings within didn't keep pace with advancements in fairness that evolved in the adult courts. In fact, 
It wasn't until the late 1960s that juvenile courts began to implement similar rights and protections. Again, change didn't come easily. Rulings in landmark cases handed down from the highest court in the land ultimately forced the modernization of the system. The United States Supreme Court in In re Galt, I believe it was 1967, said that juvenile court needed to provide the same due process protections that adult court would provide to adult defendants. For example, juveniles have a right to notice of what the charge would be. They have a right to have an attorney represent them. They have a right not to incriminate themselves by testifying. That's their choice, whether to testify or not. They have a right to appeal. They have a right to confront witnesses against them. Before 1967, those things were not true for juveniles. It was basically a free-for-all. Whatever the judge wanted to hear, they could hear. Um, hearsay would come in. We all have heard about hearsay. So the protections that are in the rules of evidence, for example, are now applicable in juvenile court as a result of that case. And then the, the next big reform was In re Winship, in which the court said that the beyond a reasonable doubt standard applies to juveniles as well. Those were major shifts in the way juvenile court handled cases. We started to see more similarities between the juvenile court and the adult court in terms of the protections that the Constitution provides, that those protections should also be applied to juveniles. While efficiency and social reform were rallying cries of the progressive movement, standardization and accountability have been the overarching themes of the modern era. The breadth of hard-won improvements applies not only to matters of the court, but also to the conditions of incarceration as well. I think when we look in the terms of um, standard of care, I think it's a good thing. It's a healthy approach. That means everybody in the Commonwealth is governed by these standards. And in order for you to operate, you must meet these standards and, 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 and these mandates. And um, it's, it's a healthy thing for the children as well as the staff. And when you look at the children, there's health care and there's educational needs, there's mental health pieces of the pie that um, may have been overlooked in the earlier days, but these things are, are, are necessary to help that child stay on the right path or get it back on the right path. Henrico has the advantage of having two facilities. They have a James River facility for longer term stays and then they have their local Henrico facility next to the Juvenile Domestic Relations Courthouse. So they have some flexibility there which not every um, locality has. The detention home is essentially like a local jail. You can be held in that facility waiting for trial. You may not get a, an ultimate sentence. You may walk out the day you go to court and just be on probation, but you can be held pretrial if the court thinks it's appropriate. If you're a danger to the community, they're afraid you won't come to court, or there's no appropriate place for you to live, the court can hold you. On the other hand, they can sentence you, and once they're adjudicated, if they get that up to a six-month sentence in post-dispositional, they go to James River. And the great thing about juvenile court is it is an individualized sentencing. You know, we really are trying to differentiate and package a disposition for each child that will address the needs of the family and the child. It is a very, very important court and what happens there shapes the future of these individuals and we will see them again if we don't do it right. Henrico's juvenile detention home is located on Dixon Powers Drive a street named for Henrico's first juvenile court judge, who also happened to live in the former administration building after the Laurel Industrial School closed. Today's state-of-the-art facility has been open since 1980 and typically houses up to 20 boys and girls between the ages of 10 and 17. Henrico has a very good reputation for running a nice facility and not being overcrowded. An important part of having a good facility is the judges really controlling who they send and not sending kids to detention unnecessarily. They have a huge amount of discretion in who they send to detention pretrial. And so those, those jurisdictions where the first answer is not always detention tend to have better facilities because they're not overcrowded. And it sometimes is a chance for kids to catch up in school because they do have teachers there. But it is still a jail. They sleep on a metal bed, just like you would in jail. They have meals at very specific times. 
They go to bed at very specific times. They're not sitting around, you know, watching TV and eating McDonald's. It's not like that at all. And kids um, often are quite shocked with how different it is from their home environment. Everything here that we do is structured. Once a kid checks in here, this is our house. You know, we kind of set the tempo that we're not antagonizing kids, but we're certainly having structure from the time you uh, get up in the morning to what you eat to when you go to school to the time you go to bed to the hygiene. Hygiene is not an uh, option here. Medical health care, that's not an option. Uh, we take care of our kids. And when society is saying this is the worst kids in Henranco County, we're going to place them inside a detention facility, we still got to reach out to those kids. And you got to embrace those kids. And you can't just look at what their criminal charges are because they're still somebody's child. We put a lot of emphasis on the educational piece in here, and we don't take no for an answer. There are kids for whom that first detention stay is a wake up call. I have seen kids get the message. They don't want to go back. And the great thing about kids is for the most part, they are savable. 